On today's episode of Tips on the Top Floor, Alan Adridge joins us to discuss how to up your videography game as a run and gun shooter. This episode is supported by discoverthetopfloor.com. Join us on one of the spectacular 2019 photo tours for some amazing photography in northern Norway on a ship around the Lofoten archipelago or on the Bohemian Castles tour to Prague and the Czech Republic to Kyrgyzstan, one of the most beautiful landscapes and cultures along the Silk Road, or to capture the breathtaking fall colors of Romania and Transylvania in fall. Spend a week or two dedicated entirely to photography and to great cultural experiences. Meet like-minded people, learn from the best and see places that you always wanted to see or that you didn't even know existed. Find out more at discoverthetopfloor.com. That's discoverthetopfloor.com. This is Dips from the Top Floor, episode 850 for Thursday, December the 13th, 2018. Tips from the top, from the top floor, tips from the top Hey, hello, welcome. It is Chris, and you're listening to Tips from the Top Floor, the podcast about all things photography. It's interview time again. Yep. Uh, today I will talk with Alan Etridge about video, all things video. Um, before that, the last Slack challenge is officially over. Thanks all for your contributions. Awesome stuff. But because the interview is a bit longer than usual, I have moved the Slack review into the next episode. So you have something to look forward to for next week. Um, that's also when Matt will give you the next Slack challenge, which is uh, another exciting one. Um, and this time we will have a bit more than a month to to submit your picture. So um, everything will be good. Um, yeah, let's not waste any time here. Back to the interview. Last week, I sat down with Alan Etridge. Alan is a professional filmmaker. Among other things, he um, shoots for Adam Corolla. He travels the world, knows a lot about shooting video, and has a lot of experience and has some great tips for you to up your game. Alan is also a podcaster. Longtime listeners will know that Alan and I go way back uh, to the time when I still lived in Tübingen in southern Germany. He's the host of the Two Hosers podcast, which is the perfect show for the person in your life who starts out in photography right now. Uh, so check those out. Links are in the show notes. And now, without further ado, here we go. Enjoy. Alan, how are you? Oh, we're starting now. Yeah, we're starting now. <laughs> okay, I'm doing good in yourself. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing awesome. I'm in the middle of editing a video project um, that I recorded in, well, I didn't shoot it, John shot it in Rochester. Okay. And I have I have like four hours of audio and video. I'm trying to make sense of it. I'm Wait, four to... hours of audio <laughs> and four hours of video separately? Well, it's, it's, it's four hours of audio from two lavalier mics. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, about two hours of video and... Yeah, just just audio in between. We had we had little recorders on people, so it was recording permanently. And John did the heavy lifting in terms of the the synchronizing of all these snippets. Mm -hmm. You know, the video comes on and off and on and off, and it has to be synchronized to that long, long audio track. Indeed, yes. And John John has this magical tool. It's, I think it's not cheap. It's called I think it's called Pluralize, mm -hmm. and it magically syncs everything up. And so that that is taken care of. But now I have this huge bunch of stuff, and I was, I was, uh, I, I was wondering. I mean, you are a professional video guy. Um, you do this kind of stuff every day, so I was wondering, like, some someone like me who doesn't shoot a lot of video, but then every now and then gets like these huge chunks in, and mm -hmm. has to make something out of that. Um, what would you do? You have any tips for? people like us the still shooters that that every now and then do video and we could start really really basic i mean we can we can start with just some general stuff how to shoot and how to how to make sense of it sure well for, sounds like you had a very very small uh crew it was a one person camera crew and myself running but the see, audio that's, pretty much that's kind of what happens a lot now i mean you mm -hmm. go into a a movie set and um there's a lot of people. And oh, yeah. There's a reason for that. I mean, it's there's a lot to do, but more often than not, you're going to find yourself, you're going to be the one-man gang. 
Mm-hmm. And that can be difficult, but it can also be pretty satisfying. And I, it's kind of how I prefer to shoot myself. So um, I think the first tip when you said, hey, can you give me some tips on, on shooting video? The first thing that came to mind is something I deal with all the time is when, when clients ask, uh, you know, can you, can you shoot video? Yes, I can. Uh, what about stills? Can you shoot stills? Yes, I can. Can you do both? <laughs> well, not at the same time. And, and I don't mean that jokingly. It's, you know what? I, I can babysit your two-year-old, or I can replace the transmission in your 1978 Ford Granada. But not at the same time. And I, if I do them at the same time, I'm not going to do a good job of either. And so, so even though shooting stills and video has this massive overlap in skill set, I mean, it, it it's does. really in, difficult. In, in the perception of a client, I think it does. I mean, you're holding a camera, you're looking through it, and you're pressing a button. That's that's what you do right. from their point of view. Um, but yeah, they are they're different skill sets for sure. Now, I think it's, it's actually getting easier and easier. I mean, with the advent of mirrorless and, and all this, it kind of makes it a little easier to do. Uh, but generally, if you if you if you want to go out and, and shoot video, my first tip is to focus on shooting video. Just be very just specify that that's what you're there to do. Any other stills that you might grab, maybe you get them, maybe you don't. But if you want to be really good at it, just focus on shooting video. Okay. Um, from then, a lot of the, like I said, a lot of crossover. You want to get good light. All the same things as you want for shooting stills are going to apply to your your video but where to go to next um well i mean it's a different thing in, in as uh you you have the motion factor you have the timing factor that you don't have with stills so i i would think you would probably frame differently and do things in video that you just can't do in stills you have to be conscious that, like, you're shooting 24 still. Well, prob you're probably shooting 24 frames per second, but you're shooting 24 stills uh, a second. And you don't, and, you know, you are going to cut away, et cetera, et cetera, later on. But generally, you have to consider that, you know, when you're shooting, maybe you shoot, you're shooting stills, you can snap a photo, wait a couple seconds, move around, snap another photo. You don't have to worry about snapping photos in that time that you're moving. Whereas when you're shooting video, you better be shooting the whole time. You can't just move the camera. You can't wander off. You, you have to be conscious of it being one continuous shot. And that's where it comes gets very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so, if, and then, for example, then Nate, you have the whole other aspect to worry about, which is the audio, <laughs> which, which sounds is, like what you're going through now, which is a lot more important i mean no the the audio we we did on that shoot we did what what uh what we've done in the past and and we've we're capturing audio separately from the video so we have two different uh media streams that we have to sync up later and right. that made that made things a lot easier because it meant that we could just stick a little uh, recording device on someone not have didn't have to worry about radio transmission to the camera and that kind of stuff or long dangling cables um mm -hmm. so it made the shooting easier but then in post-production it made things a bit harder but in general i mean the, the good sound that's that's what i know from my past as a as a sound guy is that if you want to capture good sound try to get the microphone as close to the source as possible which sure. with a camera it doesn't it doesn't it's not it's not easy to use the microphone that's built into the camera and have it sound good in interview situations because the the camera tends to be further away from the from the subject or your subject looks looks terrible because you have the camera right in their face uh, and have a better sound but yeah have, uh, have mm -hmm. big noses instead so you, yeah you you have the pretty much the the if, if you only have one camera with a built-in microphone, that's one of the issues that you are going to face. Well, if you have a DSLR and you're just using the built-in microphone, um, you're going to have trouble even recording a scratch track, meaning a, a temporary track that you're going to use later to replace. It's, it's just the, the microphones that are built into the cameras are not very good. Well, at least, at least the software that you can use today, and if I use Final Cut Pro, 
10 here and it has like a synchronization built in so it will look at the what you call the scratch track the track on the dslr uh mm -hmm. the audio track and it will look and at, at the separate audio that you give it and it will find where they belong together and how they sync up and uh but but the situation that we had was like okay 700 snippets of video mm -hmm. and two separate audio tracks and that just need some some special tools to kind of get uh, get all together into one. But the, the, we, I do have good sound now. Um, mm -hmm. I have synchronized sound now. I have uh, I have a ton of video, and of course, I will not release a two-hour video out of that. Um, editing this down into five-minute pieces, maybe. So, so what? So what? Which uh, which audio recorders are you are you using? Um, the DR, the Tascam DR110. Yes, I have a, I have three of those. Yeah, which I think you recommended to me and other people too. And it's this little, tiny little. Um, it's it's like half the size of a pack of cards, maybe, mm -hmm. and or even smaller, I think. Yeah. Or even smaller, and it comes with a with a lavalier microphone, one that you pin to your lapel. Mm -hmm. And you just put it in someone's pocket and forget about it, and it runs for hours and hours on one battery. It is amazing. And so, you know, back in the old days, and I still have my radio mic. I bought a radio mic, a Sennheiser, uh, when they became affordable. Because well, even before that, the industry standard was a product called uh, uh, made by Electrosonics. And you could buy one one mic pack, uh, meaning a transmitter and a receiver. It was about $4,000 US. <laughs> and, they, and they were excellent. Like, they were great mics. Uh, I don't know if that included the the lav mic or not. That was just the pack, and so that was kind of out of out of out of range for most people, most independent kind of run and gun style guys. And then Sennheiser had their Evolution series, which I think I paid. I'm gonna say I paid around eight hundred dollars for. Oh, that's a long a time quite, ago. Quite a bargain compared to the original. The old sure, one. and and they're very good. They weren't quite as good as the Electrosonics, but they were, it was really very good setup. And they, they've since come down in price, but and but they're pretty big and pretty heavy. Like they're metal metal. They were the size of a pack of cards, and then some, a little bit bigger than than that. And it was made of metal. It ran, took a nine volt that lasted about an hour and a half. Um, you know, and and then it would you, you'd mount the the similar sized receiver on the camera, and for the most part, assuming you weren't near an airport or a, you know, any any other transmission area, you'd get pretty good audio. You get really good audio with the occasional dropout or, or a mic hit or just some sort of static hit, which is kind of annoying. When they came out with the digital recorders, which I think they did a long time ago, but they never really caught on until a couple of years ago. This was a massive game changer because these little units run on, uh, I think it's one, is, it's one AAA battery, I think, isn't it? Uh, I think it's one AAA or one AA, but it's a tiny, uh, it's, it doesn't take a lot of energy that thing runs for. It shows you how know. often I change the batteries. That, that's yeah, not, I, I'm not I, even I, sure. I, 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 as I said, I, I put this microphone on someone, I started the recording um with on the full battery and we recorded for over four hours straight at the, the audio and then in the end the battery was still over half full right now the downside is you you can't ride levels like you don't have a dedicated audio like a audio mixer on on location like when you when they shoot you know the hollywood movies the audio team is usually you know two three guys or women and uh, who go out there, and, and there's one guy operating, one guy recording, and, and watching levels, and you would, and you would see, everything. yeah, you would, you would see that one guy holding, hold, having having a, a pack over their shoulder, hanging off of their like a big old transistor radio thing, hanging mm -hmm. over their shoulder, and then they'd have the what do you call that pole with the with the microphone at the end. We call it the fish pole. Most the, most people call it the boom pole. The fish pole, boom pole, and then they'd have a big pair of headphones on just to monitor everything and make sure they get the sound right. But that, yeah, but and, that's, and that's a million used, that's a million dollar Hollywood production. So that is a big time production, and and I've seen the like the guys who who who, who are the recorders. Like you have one guy with the fish pole. He'll be a separate guy to the the recorder. And the, and let's say they're going to be running audio. They're going to be running um, uh, radio mics. <laughs> there must be a union involved somewhere. <laughs> oh, but you you need those guys when you when you when you when you do it that, that you know 
that big, big of a production because you might have multiple booms on on one scene, right? And so, you know, and they'll have giant like like they'll they'll have the, this guy had a giant antenna like for the receiver. He didn't have the little on camera mic pack receiver. He had a giant like a nineteen seventy three TV antenna that he <laughs> yes. that he would stand. Okay, so so now we have a tiny little recorder that disappears in your pocket and a little and they in your aren't mic. perfect that's the thing they aren't perfect but for for what you want to do oh plenty they good are enough. as close to perfect as you can get because you know, you know the, the 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 microphone okay so we had two microphones we had one on the guy that that i i worked with and we had one on myself mm-hmm. and the the one on the guy was the the little Tascam box and that sound and it was set on to auto which I hate because I'm an I'm an audio guy. I want control over that, but it's sure. so good. It was so. And by the way, we're not selling this thing here. This is not, this is not sponsored at all. It's just a great little toy. Um, this was good enough for what we needed. And then my audio track was was going to a belt pack, a little transmitter, and into the camera that way. Mm-hmm. So that I don't even know what that was. Probably a Shure system. And that didn't sound nearly as good as uh, the little Tascam thing. Right. So it was like roomy, more noisy, and I'm just blown away. I think I need a second one of those. Yeah, and they're not a couple of hundred dollars, I think. Like, like $200. With, $200. Yeah, Mike included. Now, I don't, I don't shoot on auto. I, I, I Like yourself, I kind of like to have the control. And, and uh, even if the, the person talking you know, goes up and down, up and down, I'd rather deal with that later. So generally what I'll do is I'll set it to a re like there's basically, I think there's four settings, like, you know, quiet, medium, loud, and extra loud or something like that. And, um, I basically, I, I set it to one and then I run the dual recording, Yeah, which means you, it'll, it'll record a second track on a lower input level. So the same thing goes to a second track, but it is more silent. So if, if uh, something loud happens, you can, you can use the audio from that second track. Right, and it has a built-in limiter on that main track, which I do use. <laughs> so if anything ever, you know, if it's reasonable, I can just use it with the limiter. If it gets, if it's wildly distorted, I can use the second track, and that just records and records on onto a uh, what is it? What 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 are those mini SDs? Mini is micro it? SD cards. Micro SDs. And the reason I set mine to auto was because I knew we would be we'd be there for like four or five hours, and. Uh, we'd be in like five different environments and we didn't have the time. We wanted to capture as much as possible. So right. we didn't have the time to go back to the audio and change stuff and go as so this would just have limited our our ability to capture uh, this kind of a reportage style that we did. And th- and that's a big thing. That's the one that's the one thing that people don't think about when they think, you know, I want to shoot videos. So, yeah, I'll I'll just I'll do that and audio, I'm sure it'll be fine. It's and, not. You have to take a lot of care to shoot good audio. And and you, you know you know who who this who this little box was designed for? Wedding shooters, like people who shoot video on weddings, and they also yep. have to capture like a lot of diff- different things. You can see this in the in the color choice. It comes in black and it comes in white. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so you can put it on a wedding dress and and it'll be kind of inconspicuous in the video. So that's step one. I don't think we need to get into the. Uh, the post production on how to sync all this, but if you can, well, again, a tool, a tool. The tool that John used is called Plural Eyes, and mm-hmm. um, he bought. I don't know. It's it's an expensive tool. I, I looked it up, and then I decided not to get it. But for that kind of thing, uh, John threw the whole video and stuff into Plural Eyes, and it, and then it it outputs like a file for your for your video editor. And you can choose like for. Uh, for Final Cut Pro 10, for example, which is what I use. Mm-hmm. So, so I ended up having this XML, FCP XML, whatever file that then opens in in my editor, and it has a, a pre-made project in there with all the video snippets and the audio tracks all nicely lined up. So that was a huge help. I couldn't have probably done it in any reasonable time. I would have given up in between trying to manually sync that stuff. So that's the kind of tool. And then you, you end up having a, pr- a project, 
And with there are sim- ways around that. I, I, I don't, I have never used that. I've heard great things about it. There's, there's built into whatever program you're editing with now generally has a, a lighter version of that built in. True, true. And, and it, uh, so it, it, I wor- it use- works with simpler kind of setups. Like you have one audio track, you have one video track. Those will sync up in your, in your uh, video workstation for sure. Right. Or you can go old school like uh, I do. And so you've, if you've seen any behind the scenes on, on any movies ever made, you'll see them, you know, scene one, take one marker and put the, the slate in. With a and then you clapper. go, yeah, right. And that's back in the old days when, when you recorded on a Nagra uh, re- audio recorder and then you had film. Oh, and you just I put, so put a mark. one of those. The Nagra? The old Nagras, the Swiss made Nagras, the little tape mm-hmm. recorders. Oh man, I love those that's, just, just, just for nostalgia reasons. I cut my teeth on those. That was uh, it's a whole other story. But anyways, uh, so you, you, you'd mark down where the clapper happened on the audio or mark it on the, on the video, uh, on the, the film, and the rest would sync up. And so generally, that's what I have. Now, it, that's hard to do in run and gun style, um, like documentary style footage, unless you're doing interviews. But generally, what I'll have my, do, uh, my, my subjects do is just self-slate, meaning they'll just... Can you clap for me once right in front of your face? That's so you have it on video and on audio. Correct. And you can tell the people who've done it before. And uh, the ones who really know what they're doing don't even have to be asked. They'll just yell out self slate mm-hmm. and do that. And there's a guy uh, who I, I shot who did that named Keanu Reeves. <laughs> he just knew. He, lo- he looked at the situation and said, all right, here we go. Slate. You shot Keanu Reeves? A couple years ago, yeah. Awesome. At, uh, at uh, Goodwood, at the car the car race. Mm, okay, okay. And so he so knew, yeah, he he's knew a pro. what was going on. He's a pro. On. He knows that stuff, yeah. Oh, it's not his first time. But then you deal with, with, with people who've never done it before, and so you ask them, can you do me? A, can you clap for me once? And they, they think you're messing with them. <laughs> like this is some sort of a test. And they said, no, no like, I, I don't want to explain it. Okay, fine. Video's here, audio's here. I got to put them together later. This clap will help me do it. Okay, please clap for me. And then they'll kind of give a half-hearted one off off, off screen. All right. So, it. so so you end up having video audio synchronized somehow synchronized in your video editing software of choice. Um, and if then, you yeah. can do it, my my point is, if you can do it, have your subject clap for you. It'll make your life way easier later. Okay. Yes. It does help. So now the the kind of thing we did, again, we didn't know what to expect. So we shot and shot and shot as much as we could. And uh, and, and later went through the sorting. It was not a planned shoot. It, it was planned in as we knew when we were there, uh, when we were going to be there. And right. we knew how long it was uh, going to be. But then the content and everything, it was at the, at the Rochester Institute of Technology, at their photographic, photographic department. And... Uh, one of their associate professors, uh, Ted Kinsman, showed us around the little, the the the, the fun stuff they do with uh, scientific photography, high speed photography, and so on. So we, that's uh, as much as we knew. And then mm-hmm. we just uh, we just yeah asked him what what are the cool things you can show us, and he showed us this and that and this and that. So then I end up having four hours of uh, a mix of video and audio, mm-hmm. and. Uh, th- I'm at the point now where I where I decided I will not make this into one long video. I could probably make a one hour video out of that or a 45 minute video out of that. But I decided to to split it into individual uh, segments about <clears throat> about a single topic. There was like a high speed balloon popping and there was a um, he showed us a scanning electron microscope uh, microscopy and you know stuff that doesn't really belong together so i decided Mm -hmm. to make like shorter videos out of those but then still just the base material for one of those five minute videos is like an hour long sure so and i think you have this situation too so what what how how do you go about this because that one hour video is dead boring in most of the parts there's lots of pauses in between and setting stuff up and stuff that doesn't really make the video interesting Okay, so I I actually don't have this situation very often. I avoid this. You plan at all you costs. plan better, right? <laughs> um, I try to, but I've also made enough mistakes on enough shoots that I can usually identify them on the next shoot. Meaning, mm-hmm. I know what to avoid 
and the one of the, one of the notes I made when we I said we were going to talk was in 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 just all caps. Don't overshoot. Mm-hmm. Overshoot confuses things, and you'll 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 find yourself sitting in post production with with an hour of raw footage to make a thirty second clip, and it's you get paralysis of of, of choice. You have too and much, and you you don't want to you don't want to kill your your baby, so to speak, right? Well, there's that. There is that. Hey, I, I I took the time to shoot this, so I better use it. And, right. Well, it's terrible. Throw it out. You never should have shot it in the first place. So that's my 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 one thing I suggest to people is is even even if you haven't planned, try not to overshoot on the day and think, okay, I will shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. We'll shoot whatever. We should. Just keep keep always be shooting. And I've worked on projects with, with with professional, really high end guys, who that's their attitude. Oh, uh, don't just stand there, shoot something. You never know. You never know what we'll need. And I think, well, I I know I know you're not gonna. Not only are you not gonna need this, it's gonna get in the way of you of what you do need. Mm-hmm. So it's gonna take out take massive massive time suck on the on the back end. Don't do it. Now, so as a as a beginner, if someone if someone starts off doing that, I think it's very typical that they overshoot that they that they'd mm-hmm. rather have more than less stuff. So um, I know that 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 being more more conservative in in the shooting is is going to come with experience. Well, there is uh, a, there is a still a still version of this as well, mm-hmm. um, and, and you hear this from from people who are brand new and they think, well, I'll just shoot wide and I'll crop it later in post. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't really work out so well. You lose it, pixels. It, it can happen. I mean, you can get away with it, but it's not. It's not. You don't just buy a twenty-eight millimeter lens, shoot everything like that, and then and then yeah, you know, I want something nice and tight. I'll just crop in. Yeah. Don't do it. Shoot what you want. That's what. That's why I suggest. Now, obviously, you want to shoot a little bit more than you're going to need. I like to keep my shooting ratio, which means how how much raw footage I have compared to what the output is going to be. I like to keep that very very tight. How tight? And one, one to ten, one to five. Oh, ten to one. Ten to one is, r- to I one. think, is is too much. It's too much. Like for okay. for what I like to shoot. Um, now, I, I I did get my when I started out at film school. We were still shooting. It was digital video. It just kind of come in with the the VX one thousand, the Sony camera. But we were also shooting twenty four millimeter film. Oh, which is expensive. Yeah. Yes, and um, uh, sorry, twenty four millimeter, sixteen millimeter film. I invented a film format right there on the spot. <laughs> I'm pretty That's sure it is out there somewhere. <laughs> pretty sure it was 24 frames per second, but it was 16 mil film. That's all. <laughs> yes. I get. There you go. So we're shooting 16 mil, and it's expensive. I, th- I think it was about, uh, you know, a dollar a foot to shoot, and I forget how many seconds you get out of that. Four, 400 feet is 10 minutes. So you're looking at 400 dollars to shoot just to shoot 10 minutes of, of footage. Mm-hmm. You know that's processing and all that put together and the transfer. So you kind of expensive. So you you want to be very very careful with what you shoot. And so you know my final film project, I think it was like a like a maybe a three to one, maybe a two and a half to one shooting ratio. Right. And and so I've kind of pushed that over into digital, even though digital is essentially quote unquote free. You can fill up your cards. You know cards are cheap and big and. But your time is is finite. Like when you want to go on the end of a project, you don't want to have to sift through a whole bunch of footage that you don't need. So how do you keep that ratio down if you don't really know what's going to happen? Sorry for the brief interruption. Uh, Before Alan answers this question, let me just take a brief second to thank this week's sponsor, HoneyBook. Do you own a small business? Are you frustrated by dealing with back and forth emails, endless paperwork and getting paid? HoneyBook.com can help you spend less time handling the administration work and more time doing what you love. HoneyBook is an all-in-one business management platform for creative small businesses. HoneyBook makes it easy to streamline your process with client and calendar management tools and custom branded brochures, proposals and contracts. You can even get e-signatures, generate invoices and get paid faster 
all within one online system. Over 75,000 photographers, designers, event professionals and other solo entrepreneurs have saved hundreds if not thousands of hours a year with HoneyBook. And that's why TFTTF has partnered with HoneyBook.com to offer you, the listeners, 50% off the first year of HoneyBook with promo code TOPFLOOR. So get started at HoneyBook.com today and use promo code TOPFLOOR for 50% off your first year. That's half off. That's HoneyBook.com, promo code TOPFLOOR. On with the show. Um, well... You have, you have to probably anticipate a lot, right? You do anticipate a lot, but also there, there, there's the one little, the main thing I can say is that while you're not overshooting, you do want to get your coverage. So if you've got the guy talking about your, you know, the balloon, uh, the balloon popping in slow motion, for example, obviously you're, you're going to want to shoot, you, you want a shot of the balloon popping. Oh, sure. But maybe you want to get a quick three second shot of his hands setting up the balloon or um i'm trying to figure out what how how a balloon popping in slow motion well, so, so 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 the the setup is um do you have a you have a balloon you have a camera like a dslr pointing at you with a balloon in your hand and then they freeze the motion of the popping balloon by uh killing the lights and and firing a flash based on the sound of the balloon so you get okay like a open shutter brief burst like twenty thousandth of a second of flash and then the lights come back on and the balloon is popped and the picture is hopefully in the dslr so something like this is going to be maybe five minutes of him talking about it in, in this case it was a class that he held in front of uh, students so he, he was spending more time on that so we were talking mm -hmm. that that whole thing with uh several people doing it um so we have like 10 people popping a balloon. We have him explaining the whole thing for 20 minutes. Um, so it, it, it was hard to anticipate what he would say when. So that's why we shot the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and editing that down, yep, it takes time. We have a, a few really good bits and it's really painful to throw away a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think the result is okay if if you have the, like, the stamina to edit all that. And I think I've spent on that popping the balloon sec uh, section. I think I've spent probably an hour editing that now, mm -hmm. which is which is okay. F it feels and the still final okay. output's going to be how long? Oh, about five to eight minutes. Sure, that sounds about right. And uh, uh, but but what, I have one problem. Okay, so here's here's a very 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 concrete problem. You want to edit down what someone says. I'll have 10 minutes of him talking into like half a minute to one minute maximum. Mm -hmm. And you end up with a lot of weird looking cuts because the camera's on as his face. As long as they sound good, you're going to be okay though. They sound fine, but you get a lot of what, what I think is called jump cuts where yes. you, it, nothing changes but his face. So he jumps. It, it, you, you do, it visually, it's visually weird. So when, when I shoot this, how I end up shooting this is I'll shoot his whole speech. So you say it's an hour, 10 minutes, whatever it is. I'll shoot, shoot the 10 minutes and want to cut it down to a minute. So what I'll do is I take that 10 and then I'll just go through and cut it to what, what's, what they call a talk line. So mm -hmm. I don't care what it looks like, the jump cuts, as long as it sounds good to me. Okay. As long as it sounds as, as if, as, if with my eyes closed, it sounds like it's one continuous speech. Mm-hmm. And then I go through and I look and identify all those all those jump cuts that you're talking about. Now you don't notice the jump cuts in audio; you only notice them in video because that's mm -hmm. what changes. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go in and cover those. Now because on the day when he was giving his speech, either we had two cameras rolling or probably not. I don't typically shoot with two cameras because that doubles your footage you have to sift through later. But what I will do is in the next speech he's giving about something completely unrelated. I will go and stand next to him and just pick up shots of the audience looking at him. Mm. These are be cutaways. And so now we have someone nodding and, uh, oh, yeah, sure, that sounds interesting. Uh, and, and, then, and then I'll cut like a two-second clip in. Every time there's a jump cut, we cut to an audience member nodding knowingly, even though it's from a different – it's from a completely different speech. We don't have to – we don't have – am so I you, showing you, behind you, the curtain too much here? 
No, no, this is exactly what I, what I want to hear. So, so you're covering your crimes, pretty much. Yes, you want to you want to cover that all up. Now, I know go. I I, I have an idea when I'm when I shoot the first the initial speech that um, I think okay, great. You know, I'm taking this ten minutes. Going to go down to one. I have an idea that I'm going to need probably eight cutaways. And so I make sure I get eight to ten cutaways. I do overshoot a little bit, just in case you need. So you know, those cut cutaways. Uh, that's that's sometimes. Is that the thing that sometimes also referred to as B roll? That could be B roll. I, I tend to yeah yeah B roll is kind of a catch all because uh -huh. you have cutaways in this case, or you have inserts or just action stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I also shoot inserts. So if he's talking about you know popping a balloon, I'll get a close up shot of maybe the guy blowing up a balloon or, or, or something, some, some bit of action that I can get a close up of later on, not while he's talking. We deal with that later. So you make a, you make, during that speech, you make a mental note of the things that you might need to kind of right. add in as right. additional material. For example, we, we, I, I was recently, I've, I've gone a few times, but recently I was at, uh, at the, the, the Goodwood uh, Festival of Speed shooting a bunch of interviews with car racing guys. And they'll sit and talk about their, for example, their $50 million Ferrari and standing next to it. But, we, we, you know, so he'll say, oh, yeah, this, you know, this, this, and this, this about the car. And, oh, it's got this part of the engine, et cetera, et cetera. And as soon as we're done, like we'll have a 10, 15 minute interview with the guy. We basically have to remember all the things that he talked about. And we'll go shoot close ups of, of the gear shift of the, of, you know, of, of the engine of this, of this, of this. So that later on, we can, they can, I'm not doing the cutting, but whoever's doing it can cut it together. So you're, and, you're just, you're just feeding cuts. the material pretty much. Right. Very cool. But I, what, what I don't want to do is just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and go, okay, here you go. Now make a story. That, that gets very, very, that, that'll, that'll, that'll drag you down. I know. <laughs> I'm in the middle of that right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's coming together. It's slowly coming together. Uh, well, the, one one of the important things, though, is I mean, you were you were there when it happened. That that's that's key. Is because if you're handed a, just a, like a hard drive of okay, here you weren't here when this was shot. Here, take this and make it into something, which I've I've had to do. I that was actually suck fired. because you you have to watch every single bit. Where whereas I was there and I remember what happened when, and uh, I'm I'm still yes. close enough to it, so not to not have forgotten the important. And that's bits, almost. Yeah. Everything I do is is that the stuff I shoot. I shoot f most of what I do is I shoot for my own edit, and the, and then sometimes I'll and then the second job is that I'll I'll shoot for someone else to edit. But I still approach that in the way that I like, if I had to edit it, here's how I would shoot this, so that hopefully they can look at it and go, all right, this is all the the, the, the puzzles got to be put together, but at least I see the pieces. And, and all the pieces are there. I know all the pieces are there. I can do this. And the last job I've, I, I, I've had to do very, very rarely. And the last time I did it, I was fired. So uh, <laughs> it, it was an entire documentary was shot. And it was a documentary that a very intricate story, an amazing story. But th even though... Now, okay, now, now there's two kinds of documentaries, really, two main kinds. There's documentary of something that, that, that is happening. Like, for example, a filmmaker goes to Syria and is documentary, documentary, documenting the struggle that is occurring right now. Mm -hmm. Now, in that case, you don't know the story. You don't know how it's going to end. And, and that and is then, legitimate if you, if you have not planned this, and that's legitimate to then uh, try to find the story in the footage. Right. I mean, oftentimes you'll be, you'll, you'll, you'll find the story as you're shooting it and right. you'll kind of sh you'll sh shape it that way, but you're open to anything. And so the story can change. And then there's the kind of documentary, which shouldn't be called a documentary, still good movies, but it's, you look back at the past and go, oh, okay. Uh, let's say the meme, I don't know, like the stuff, some of the stuff I did at Goodwood is they're talking about the 1966 battle between Ferrari and Ford. So, okay, but well now every, that's already happened. So you know the story. So going in, you should you have an idea of the narrative that you want to do. And so the, the the project I was handed, it was a story about the past, a very intricate story. But I got the the sense that the filmmaker 
didn't know the story he wanted to tell while he was filming. And so they filmed and filmed and filmed and filmed and filmed. And I had to sit there and watch, I forget how many hours of footage. Like it was, it took me weeks of just eight hours a day, just watching all the raw footage and logging it all and deciding then, okay, now what do you, what do you, what do you, what's the story? How, how well, do we start? That, that, uh, explain the term logging. Is that like putting keywords on things so you can find them later? Uh, yeah, I'm writing down time codes. Okay, this happened here. Okay, okay, here's, okay. A, here's a shot of, of the subject doing this Holy and this cow. and this and talking about that this. That sounds cumbersome. Oh, it's terrible. And ha had I been there when we were shooting it, I would have a much better idea of, okay, good. I know we don't need, we don't need this, 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 or this. I remember there's being something good in here. We can use that. But having to go back and sift through it all later, and again, not, not shot with any particular purpose. It was just kind of, okay, let's see what happens. And then making a story, making a story out of it is very, very difficult. So I guess my tip to the listener is don't put yourself in that position. You're, you're honestly better off. You're better off, especially if, if it's a non-critical thing. Like if you're going to go out and shoot something that's, that's, you know, maybe a short five minute project that's, that's not, you're not getting paid for, for example, and, and it's not someone's wedding or something critical like that. Do yourself a favor and undershoot and see what happens. See what happens later. And, and you'll learn a lot more from that and think, okay, next time I'll shoot these three more shots and that's all I need. I don't have to, it's like overpacking. You don't have, you don't have to have, you don't, have, you don't, you don't need nine t-shirts. Maybe you wear a dirty t-shirt one day. So what? Mm -hmm. There's a video version of that. Maybe, maybe yeah. you only use yeah. two seconds of that, of that cut over, uh, cut away instead of, instead of four seconds, but you'll be fine. You'll learn for next time. All right. So, so what did you shoot this with? I'm interested to know what, 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 first of all, did you shoot it? Did well, John, John shot it. I was part of the action. So I visited that, that, uh, associate professor, Ted Kinsman, he showed us around and it's me asking nosy questions and having him, um, show us stuff and include me in that one class where they did the balloon popping and, uh, and so and what, what, what was things. it shot on? It was shot on a DSLR on a oh, Canon 5D Mark III, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think John used the 24 to 105 uh, lens, so he had some uh, some zoomability on it. And yeah, again, the audio track. My audio track was shot on the little Tascam DR 110. Mm -hmm. No, that that was that was Ted's audio track. My audio track was shot through a. I think a Shure radio system that John also recorded. And that essentially essentially became your scratch track. Well, the scratch track is the track from the camera, which was again a third track. So the... the oh, no. Oh I, th oh, I thought you said... Okay, so I thought you re recorded the, your radio mic directly to the camera. No, no, no. It was not recorded to the camera, but to a recorder that John monitored on an earpiece. So okay. he, he knew my sound was good. I relied on that little box to capture Ted's sound. I mm -hmm. did. I tested it up front, so I was sure we were getting something good. I uh, was very careful with the microphone placement because if you don't monitor a lavalier mic, um, I know from experience that it can rustle, shirt rustle, that kind of stuff, yes. and that can that can completely kill an audio track. So uh, make it t totally unusable. So I made really sure that it's free. Even if he moves, it doesn't scratch against his shirt. Um, I'd rather have that than than being able to hide a microphone away from view. I know some people yes. do that, but I'd rather have a clearly visible mic, but one that just sounds good. It depends on your on the style. I mean, yeah, there, there, there are things where you might want to hide a microphone under a shirt and, and tape it to the shirt or in mm -hmm. a wig or I, what I've recently seen. Tie. Was, My favorite is in the knot of a tie. In the knot of a tie is cool. And what I've seen, I've, I've, I've of course, researched that. <laughs> and, um, uh, the one thing I've seen, I've seen Adam Savage do is he hid a microphone for, for being on stage in his glasses. Mm -hmm. So he he had that that microphone on the inside of the temples of the glasses and the oh, yeah. wire the wire going back behind his ear along the the, the thing and uh, it, it's it feels like it's far away from the mouth but it sounds really good up there so right. he was on stage with his glasses no visible microphone and he just yeah the sound guys were really happy with what he delivered 
that's a whole another show is, is yeah is my, my <laughs> but so for I'm, I'm glad to hear you shot with well first of all i just picked up the 24 to 105 it's uh, a lens i've been avoiding i never bought the, the kit lens when i bought my mark ii it is quite um, sturdy and versatile it is it, it it's one of those lenses that i've used it on a few projects i bought it specifically for video because a lot like most of the times like i'm a humongous snob and, and i'm shooting stuff where i where i have control I love, I have a couple of cinema lenses for the, for the Mark III. And uh, I have the 85 mil and the 35 mil by, um, is it Rokinon? What, what, I forget how it's branded in the different continents. Oh, Samyang, Rokinon, yeah. Samyang, the all the same thing. And so I have the, the T15s uh, for the 35 and the 85 mil lenses, and they are amazing. Like okay, wait, wait, wait. Before we continue on that, t- tell us why... Okay, so I know I know there's a lot of companies that want to sell you cinema lenses, specific movie lenses over your DSLR R lenses that you already have. Why? Mm-hmm. Why would I want a different lens? How how are they different from like still lenses? Uh, they're first of all, they're most likely in my case they are manual focus mm-hmm. uh, with a full with a full barrel stock. Meaning like they like you have your your like the twenty four to one hundred five for example, or or any of your autofocus lenses have basically they have an internal focus and an external focus ring. Mm-hmm. And so if you were to say let's say you're to autofocus and then move the ring. Um, there's no direct correlation between oh. ring position and internal focus. The, the ring kind of slips at the end. Yeah, once you get to infinity, you can keep spinning. So if you want to put a mark down, like let's say let's say you want to actually pull focus, which means you 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 have two marks. You have mark A, mark B. So before you roll, you're gonna you're gonna have your actor stand on mark one. You get focus. You put a little mark on the the tape that's on your on the barrel of your lens. Have them walk to the second position. Refocus. And put a second mark on the tape that you put on on the barrel of your lens. Now, when you go to shoot, you don't even have to look at them. The focus puller can go from mark one to mark two on the lens, and they'll be in focus the whole way. Okay. Now you can't do that on the autofocus lenses because if you bump it, now those 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 physical external marks will no longer line up. Right. Most likely. Um, so there is that, and then and then these these cinema lenses have the the aperture on the barrel themselves instead of dialed in on the back of the uh, in, in the Canon case the the wheel on the back of the camera right so so it, you you operate that aperture directly on the lens that's a physical connection again yes and there's no there's no f6.3 uh-huh. which is very important i mean we, we they deal in 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 you know f2 2.8 and in between it's it's, incre- it's there's no there's no click clicks in between there's no third of a stop in between it's basically an analog. It's a smooth in, transition between correct. the different Correct. So they call it declicked, and it's, so it's very, very handy. You, you can dial it up and up and down, you know, mid shot if you need to, and it's quiet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I love these. But the, and and they're they're extremely good at one thing. They're extremely good at being a, a very fast eighty-five millimeter lens. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to do the run and gun and run around and shoot, which I was doing, at, for example, at Goodwood. I was I was part of the camera crew. There's there's two or three shooters on any given shoot, so I wasn't responsible for all focal lengths. In my case, I was lucky. I I, I was in shooting in tight, so I just shot with the 85 mil. That was fine. But on a lot of the shoots, you have to shoot very very quickly. You don't have time to quickly change lenses, let alone carry that lens. Like they're they're a hassle to carry everything around with you if you're going to run all over the place and shoot. Right. You don't want to also have a backpack full of lenses that you then have to take off and switch over to the 35, get the wide, pop the 85 back on, get the close. So I bought the 24 to 105, um, kind of reluctantly, because I'm not a humongous fan of of zoom lenses in general. I'm not a huge fan of f4. I mean, I like shooting at f4, but I don't like it to be my maximum. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but I picked it up and I got to tell you, I love that lens for shooting video. It's great. It's got the built-in IS, which is fantastic for handheld stuff. It's not a, a solution to holding the camera still. You still, you still want to hold the camera still. But it but takes it kinda, those little, those little jitters out. That's the big thing it does. Yeah. 
is Espe I mean, especially with the longer focal length every tiny movement you would otherwise see in the video yeah normally i wouldn't shoot handheld at, at 105 mils yeah. but with the is you can do it it's pretty good yeah providing i mean i, I suggest getting an eyepiece too but that that's something separate but uh I do so. If you want to invest in the cinema lenses, I highly recommend the Rokinons. They're very, they're they're sort of the much cheaper version. You can get the very, very expensive ones, um, but the Samyang ones, I actually like the fact that they're cheap. They're not cheaply built. They're built very well. Um, they're 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 sharp enough, but I don't think they're quite as sharp as the four thousand dollar lenses, mm -hmm. which I happen to like. But for most people who want to get into shooting video on their cameras and their still cameras, um, that's not a that's not a requirement. You could you can totally get away with your fifty one point eight and yes and and shoot oh more than get away with it. You're going to get great results. Yes, yes, yes. So so the cinema lens is one of those things. If you have a specific shooting style, if you if you if you once you shot for a few years, that's something you might want to look into, but not from the start. But okay, let's 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 take someone who's going to be uh, is a still shooter wants to shoot around with video a little bit. I would say the first thing you do is get, get the, the lens you just mentioned, get the fifty mil f one eight or the one four if you want to spend a couple extra bucks. But the, you're, you'll do just fine with the one eight for. I guess you can get the um, the knockoff version for around sixty bucks now. All right, yeah, and that's uh, that's plenty good for for the beginning. Oh, that's you're you're, you're going to get great video, and you're off and running. Um, set, you know, do you want to get into all the, the settings really quickly, or say it again? Do you want to get into all the settings, like you know, the basic no, settings? No, no, I no. Let's, let's 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 do a quick a quick list of like what do you need to get started if you haven't done that before. If you want to get some some somewhat professional video, so that okay. kind of a, that kind of a lens is a good starting point. Mm -hmm. um, from an audio point of view, do you need an external recorder or could you just, like if your camera has a microphone port, could you just plug in a long cable with a microphone? Uh, oh, you could do that. I mean, you could run, that's, I suggest getting an external. If you're going to have an external mic, if you're going to spend the money on an external mic, I would buy one of these Tascam mic packs. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I have three of them and I also have, the version that snaps onto the onto the fishpole mic itself. I have a shotgun mic, a Sennheiser ME66 that I use with. I also have a Zoom uh, H4n, which I I, I like. I, I love that's the a thing. recorder. That's that's a, a recorder. Yeah. But sometimes I want to go even even lighter, and so I have the the Tascam. It's the exact same unit that records with the lav mics that you have. But it actually has the the XLR end to it, and it plugs directly into the mic into the boom mic and basically just records digital right onto the right out of the mic. Mm -hmm. So I would get something, something like that. If you're going to spend the money, first of all, I would, I, I would probably get the one that, that you have, get that lav mic and that's all you're going to need. Another mm -hmm. advantage of, of like a 51.8 because it's a pretty bright lens is that you can often get away without additional light, right? Yes. Yeah. You can shoot everything at 1.8. De depending on your camera and, and you have to be good at focusing though if you shoot everything at 1.8 okay that, that that becomes the issue yes <laughs> um but you, you that's something you can you can work on it a lot of factors if, if that's the case if you're really worried about focus the next thing you you should look into when, once you start getting good is i would suggest getting an external eyepiece this was a massive game changer for me I found that like I, I just holding the camera and looking at the the LCD screen, I just felt like a soccer mom, and I didn't like that too much. <laughs> okay, so so with an eyepiece, you mean one of these things that you put on the back of your camera on the screen, and it has a magnifying glass in it, and you, you right you hold you hold this to your eye. You hold this to your eye. So I have the the Zacuto Z Finder. Um, there's cheap cheaper versions. Definitely, I would suggest getting one of these. It allows you to get a really good basically a really good view of the LCD screen, keep everything in focus. It also adds another point of contact, meaning you're holding the, the camera against your face, which helps steady your shot. All right. That, that's important. Yeah. 
that is very, that, that, that's wildly important because you'll find that, okay, all of a sudden it's, it's very, very shaky, especially if you don't have the IS. Um, now, the old, uh, you can get one for, for relatively cheap, a couple, a hundred bucks, 150 bucks, I think. Uh, the next thing I would look at, even, even if you have an external mic, I recently picked up one of the little mini, uh, mini shotgun mics. The, like a for, road for the, uh, something yeah road micro something so that, that's one that goes that goes on your on your on your flash hot shoe on top of the camera right and then and, point, uh, points and and are they i mean okay they will probably let you that you get a bit further away from a subject with it still sounding good as compared to the built-in microphone right it does. It does a great job. Very directional. I am surprised. I'm genuinely shocked at the quality. Again, I think it was around sixty dollars, maybe fifty euros or something like that. Which I thought, okay, how good can this be? The reviews were great. I thought I'll try it. If I don't like it, I'll send it back. I didn't send it back. I love the thing. It's cool. got a little little eighth inch stereo cable that plugs into your camera. The power runs off of your camera's power, so it's very very simple. Um, it's not going to replace your lav mic, but it will provide a much better scratch track and possibly a usable audio track. I am looking at it right now. It's 45 euros, 46 euros, road right. video micro. Uh, you need you need a, a, a an audio a microphone uh, plug on your camera though. Uh, yes, don't most of them have them? Well, there are, there are some that don't, so that's why I'm why I'm bringing it up okay yes make sure you have one first before you do that so with, with that that you should be off to the races that that's that's pretty much going to get you started into shooting into what you need um and and the the main tip i would say skill wise forget all the settings we you, you can find those online have a a very solid understanding of what of depth of field mm -hmm. how to achieve it what it is for for the aforementioned focus um be very familiar with manual mode on your camera and that's it you're set well and then you need a project something to document something to to practice on so mm -hmm. with your friends with your family it could just be a barbecue it could just be something that you want to kind of uh, make a little few minute vignette out of. I think that's that's kind of good practice project. I remember you and I we did something back when I when I lived in Tübingen, little um, a, a little I think one minute video about uh, loading film into like loading roll film one twenty roll film into a an old camera, mm -hmm. and the, I I had that idea that I wanted to make a little thing a video out of that. I'm gonna link that in the show notes. Um, and the, uh, the the second idea I had was I want to have this all be very close up, very macro. So uh, I remember us put, putting together the different steps and shooting them with a little slider, very like plan shoot. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's focus from here to there. And uh, in the end, that was a good project to learn because we ended up shooting, I don't know, maybe three to one. Like really mm -hmm. tight, uh, really, really uh, as, as little as possible with just like a couple of tries for each of the things to make sure we had some choice. And then editing that together was a breeze. And sure. I still I still love how it came out. So that, yeah, that good memories, good learning experience. And you had fun shooting it. I absolutely did, yeah. And um it was yeah, I had never shot a, a project quite like that. So getting to shoot all all this macro, I think we shot a lot with your, you had the hundred mil macro, didn't you? It was not yeah, the hundred millimeter uh, f two point eight three point five macro lens. Um, I think mm -hmm. that was the only lens we shot that with, and it yeah, it I, I'm I, I still love it. Yeah, and still I think, I think still we out used there. the roller skate dolly. There was a little a little dolly slider kind of thing that we used for that. So instead of doing a focus rack, we moved moved the camera from A to B and make sure that mm -hmm. it all falls in place. In, in essentially, this is a this this has been no better time to get into doing something like this. Like I, when I was a kid, uh, I, I was really interested in all this, so I would go out and shoot. Like my friend had a 
a video camera that had a long cable that you plugged into your VHS machine. And so you had to hit record on the VHS and, and et cetera, et cetera, and shoot and shoot. And then somehow edit it. You'd have two VHS machines. One would play, one would record, and you had to make all these linear edits. And that was a lot of fun. What's available to kids now, or adults for that matter, I don't know why I said it like adults, adults, <laughs> what is available for, for, the, for the price that's available is mind-blowing. To go and shoot HD... And forget about 4K. If you're listening, if you're listening and think, "Oh man, I gotta get something that's 4K," you don't. Don't worry about it. Just shoot with your your 1080p. It's awesome. What's available to you? And then to go into, I mean, there there are cheap cheap versions of of video editors. I mean, I, I even think that what Final Cut Pro is is pretty cheap nowadays. I don't know the price. I bought it once and kept updating. So. Um... Yeah, it's it's the right time to start this, and maybe. no better time. So get out there and, and and learn. Get out there and make mistakes. Maybe we manage to to plant a few ideas, and if you have any video projects out there that you're proud of, done with your still cameras, hey, share them. Share them here, Alan. Thank you so much for spending the time, getting us a little little insight here. Um, you do this professionally. Where can people find you? Where, where, where Where's your stuff? Uh, you can find me at alanatridge.com or the website for my podcast is twohosers.com, which I co-host with a guy named Adam Schwartz. We talk a little bit about video, mostly about stills. No, no crossover to your audience, though. No no, no poaching. <laughs> you, every, everyone, go check out the Two Hosers as well. And thanks, Alan. Thank you. And that was it with this episode of Tips from the Top Floor. A huge thank you goes out to the new patrons, Ryan, Jeremy, Doug, Roger, Greg, Arthur, and Stu. You guys are amazing. The sponsorships are by far not enough to finance this show, so you and all the other patrons are essential to help keep the show going. I can't thank you enough for that. If you want to join in to support TFTTF, starts at one dollar and you'll be in great company go to tfttf.com slash patreon that's tfttf.com slash patreon thank you so much you're awesome and of course i'd also be happy if you could leave a little review or just a star rating on itunes that makes the show just a little bit more visible Music for the show by Jeff Smith, silent partner in Hans Peter Kagrod, publishing and Slack challenges by Release Pixie, Matt Ravsitar Armstead, Slack invitations by Chief Invitation Officer, CIO Rusty Russ, and the link to get on the Slack is in the show notes, tfttf.com slash whyslack. My name is Chris Markward. You'll find me on social media, including Mastodon at Chris, M-A-R-Q-U-A-R-D-T. Go out and take amazing photos. And I told you Share them with the world. Be nice to each other. And happy shooting. Me